Good afternoon, everybody. I see the room filling up with people, so I will wait for a few more seconds to everyone to get into this call. Um, I hope you can all hear me correctly. I'm really pleased to be here today virtually uh, by this joint webinar of the Institute of International and European Affairs and the Klingendal Institute in The Hague. Um, I think we have reached almost all participants now, so I will start for this coming hour and a quarter. Um, welcome, my name is Brigitte Decker and I'm a research associate at the Klingendal Institute. And today I will guide you through this webinar on navigating Europe's digital transition, recalibrating industrial policy, EU connectivity and international partnerships. Um, that's a whole mouthful, but before we move into our fantastic panel we have here today, I will first give the floor to Joyce O'Connor. She's with us today for a word of welcome, and she's among many things, the chair of the digital group of EEAI. And um, thereafter, I will introduce the panel to you, and we will start with the introductions on the topic. And of course, you have uh, the opportunity to have a Q&A. Joyce, thank you for being here today. The floor thank is yours. Thank you very much, Brigetta, and a very warm welcome from Dublin to you and to our panelists and to our audience. And a special thanks also, Brigetta, to you and your colleagues at the Clinningdale Institute for organizing and moderating this webinar. This event, as you said, is part of an international project called Europe's Digital Future, which is coordinated by the Institute of International and European Affairs and is supported by Google. As part of this project, a network of think tanks and research institutes in the Netherlands, Denmark, Estonia and Ireland are exploring what the concept of digital sovereignty means and what future it might hur hurl for the EU, particularly for small open economies like Ireland and the Netherlands. Our network had its first event in Dublin. At that stage, Michael, you were asking about the weather. It was sunny, not like today in, in July in 2021. And that day we launched our joint publication on Europe's digital future, Perspectives from Northern Europe. This is the third in a series of project events taking place in member states, capitals, in Copenhagen, in Stockholm and Dublin. On topics such as the Digital Markets Act, the European Chips Act. To learn more about the project and to see the earlier events and publications, please visit the IIEA website at www.iiea.com. Today's webinar is very timely and is a valuable contribution to our overall project. Governments around the world are addressing the rapid development of digital technologies and the various policy challenges to which these technologies give rise. This webinar will touch upon some of the most crucial thematic issues that our network is researching, including topics such as EU connectivity, international partnerships, and the balancing of economic interests, security, and citizens' rights. So we look forward to our panel discussion with Micah, Helene, and Eric, uh, and I'll hand you over now to Brigetta to introduce and moderate today's webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joyce. Pleasure of having you here today. If you have any questions during the debate, feel free to stab in. We really uh, also want to hear your opinion as well, of course. Um, then over to the panel. We're really happy that we have an excellent panel here today uh, with three people. First of all, Michael okano heimans uh, a colleague of mine, a senior Klingenel colleague, uh, expert, a pioneer in the field of exploring digital connectivity within the EU and especially also outside of the EU. Um, we have Eric O'Donovan today, uh, who is the head of the digital economy policy of Irish Business and Employers Confederation since 2016. Um, and he also represents the EBAC um, networks within national EU and OECD partners on digital policy. And last but definitely not least, we have Helene Bakker. She has been the Director of European and International Affairs at the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate in the Netherlands uh, since 2020. And before, she has worked for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and at the Embassy of the Netherlands in the US. 
So I'm really glad to have you all here together. I think you make a wonderful team. Um, to start with the introductions, I first want to say to the audience, if you have questions, please post them in the Q&A box. Um, already during the presentations, maybe some questions might pop up. Feel free and we will try to make it all, um, all work either after an introduction or after all the introductions. So maybe um, starting with Micah. Uh, Micah, thank you for being here. We have seen that governments around the world are struggling to deal with this rapid development, digitalization, uh, the policy challenges we see coming from technological changes. And the European Union, as the regulatory power in the world, um, has grappled to, to these problems and uh, published its global gateway, among others, also the digital strategy we have seen. And I was wondering if you could give this panel and the audience some context on what the EU is doing and has been doing the last years and how it relates to its digital strategy, the global gateway and the international outlook the EU has. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Brigitte, for this uh, for this very important question, uh, and thanks for to IIA for for doing co-organizing this with us. It's really a great pleasure, and and the uh, the project that you were just describing, Joyce, I think is is really fantastic, bringing Europeans together. Um, I, I we're having many talks also as a, a, us as a think tank with, uh, for example, the United States and uh, with partners in in Asia. Um, and it's so important that we're also having this uh, EU internally, because uh, obviously we can only do this if the EU is, is very strong. That's in, uh, in fact a key point that I would like to make and that we hope we can, we can get to contributing to with this conversation. Um, so I'd like to elaborate a little bit on the, on the changing geopolitical context um, <clears throat> and indeed also sketch a, a broad picture, I think, for how uh, the EU can translate this, this new vision. Uh, you mentioned Global Gateway already, Brigitte, um, how we can translate that into action, because that's obviously gonna be the most challenging and the most important part. Um, and I think how we're gonna do this, um, Eric from a private sector perspective and Elaine from a, from a government perspective uh, will we'll then add to, uh, so I think it was really um, very well, uh, well set up this panel. Um, so as a, as a starting point, let me just say the obvious. We're obviously going through a, a period of very profound change uh, where we see uh, global economics and politics and security increasingly intertwined. Um, this is nothing new, you know, and, and we all have known it for quite some time, but the challenge continues to be how do we act on this? Um, because, um, well, states are increasingly more conflictual, the domains are more integrated, so we see uh, what I uh, often call a clash of capitalisms, where it's no longer the market-driven capitalist system that is, is the only uh, system in town, it's clearly also state-driven systems of, of varying sorts, and we have some of that, of course, uh, dif differences in Europe also, but the differences with countries outside of Europe is, is so much greater, and that's what we're responding to. We're also responding to this um, well, intensifying clash, of course, between especially the United States and China, uh, Russia, of course, of a different sort. So we hear a lot about that, that uh, these days in Europe, uh, but in the digital uh, connectivity sphere, um, well, I, I would like to stick to just the, the, the clash uh, that we see mostly coming between uh, the United States and, and China, because China is a, such a strong player also in the field. It's clearly a disruptor. Um, also in the not so positive sense, but it's a disruptor also in the positive sense that it's having, you know, many new industries, many new companies that uh, conquering the world. And they bring, of course, with them standards um, and, uh, and, and systems uh, to other parts. And I think this is what we're having to respond to. And this is where Global Gateway, to my mind, comes in, um, because that's the new label given to that EU effort to, to change its, uh, well, to inter link all the various uh, elements, uh, economics, politics, and security, and to do so in its international foreign policy. And we know that the EU does not have a clear mandate for foreign policy, but still the EU is wanting now to make a, a uh, well, uh, get a stronger role in this. Um, so in a sense, I always think of this as sort of the external dimension of industrial policy, if, we will, if you will, because industrial policy is, of course, preparing at home better um, on the protect side and on the promote side for that clash of capitalisms and, and power shift. Um, and I think that we have forgotten sometimes that this also requires sort of in, an, a change, in, a similar change in external policy. 
And to my mind, that's what Global Gateway is. And digital is one very important element in this um, because we are going through the fourth industrial revolution, because we have been forced to go online, all of us, even more than we had wanted um, because of this COVID period. Um, so digital is very important. And that's a change from the strategy that actually preceded Global Gateway, uh, the connectivity strategy, where digital was one element, but really transport connectivity was much more important. Um, in this Global Gateway, it's really a focus on, on digital. And I think what's important here um, is that, and this is where I see change in the EU, uh, where we see an interest-driven agenda. Uh, finally, we are starting to talk about what are our interests in the world and how do we protect and promote them. Um, and this again may sound obvious, but I think for a long time we haven't really had to think these through uh, because we could just assume that many countries would follow our interests and that, that we would have shared interests. And now we see increasingly more conflict of interests, so we have to more clearly define our interests. And I, I, I think it's important that the EU is trying to do that to support that conversation between EU member states because only if we can get to that sort of common approach, we can have a common EU policy also outside of the EU. And there's a need for digital resilience here, of course. There's a need for increased economic competitiveness also in the digital fields. Um, you know, if we think, of course, of the, the big players in the digital field, we think of American companies and Chinese companies, uh, the Googles and the Amazons and the Tencents and the Alibabas. We need more European companies of that kind, I think. Um, and in some sectors, including in the fintech sector, we see strong European players, um, in other sectors uh, less so. So I think it's important that the EU is also investing in this. And, and this is also how I see sort of the domestic or the EU internal industrial policy linked with the external global gateway policy, um, where we also have to sometimes sort of help or uh, assist our companies in, in going outside. Um, and I, I mean, outside EU external. So I think it's an extremely important agenda that we're talking about here. It's not coming sort of out of the blue, of course. Uh, this is building on, uh, to my mind, three very important uh, prior uh, well, strategies that we had also at the EU level. Um, the Digital Compass, of course, that was published uh, last year uh, with its focus on digital skills and, and e-governance, uh, so government pub better public uh, governance in the digital sphere, digital identities offering better uh, opportunities for citizens to access, uh, also government services, um, also the business domain. So we see the very comprehensive uh, policies at the EU level, and this is spreading now also. And of course, EU member states contributing to this. Then we also had um, the, uh, the Indo-Pacific strategy, which was sort of the other side of the coin of our China strategy. So this is dealing with the, the clash of capitalisms, if you will, the change in you know, state-driven systems and, uh, in the world. And then we had the connectivity agenda, which sort of, as I said, preceded Global Gateway, um, but was led by the External Action Service. That in itself uh, could have been, you know, made it a success. But since this is, you know, there's this need to connect the dots, really, uh, the external action service, the MFA alone cannot do this. You know, we are here, of course, joined by Helene Bakker of the Ministry of Economic Affairs now. We also have our uh, digitalization ministries or DG Connect in the EU. Um, you know, there's the climate, of course, that's also increasingly more important. So it's extremely, I think, valuable that it was Ursula von der Leyen here herself at the very top level that is forcing change and forcing us to connect the dots in a way that, frankly speaking, the external action service, they tried with the connectivity strategy and it they did, didn't really work. Um, so when I speak to EU officials, uh, even just this morning, uh, what, what I'm always happy to hear is that now finally also, we're getting money with this uh, initiative. Um, because of course, without the money, there's not gonna be any projects. Um, and there's also a, a better understanding that the private sector, you know, we need to engage more with our stakeholders and the private sector is a very, very important one. Who are going to build the submarine cables that we're talking about, right? Who are going to uh, bring new rules and standards to foreign markets? That's the FinTech companies or uh, in other different sectors. It's really the private sector that plays a, an extremely important role here. And we have to, I think, um, well, to deepen our engagement with them, to get a better understanding of what they need when they go outside of the EU. Of course, we're having these conversations more already within the EU. And I would love to hear from Eric whether, you know, what 
could, they could do also to help them support going outside of the EU, because that's really, I think, a next level. This is not something that the, that the governments can do by themselves. Um, so I see really this, this new vibe for, for change. It's a new level of energy. It's a new level of commitment and understanding that we also, it's not the EU, it's also the member states themselves really that, that have to build um, ownership with this initiative. That I think also was where connectivity initiative failed and where this, you know, we hear increasingly more of team Europe initiative. Um, happy to elaborate more if this doesn't ring a bell to everybody, but this is basically improved cooperation between the EU and the member states and stakeholders. And this is, you, you could say, oh, another new label, uh, but I think I really see initiatives already developing. There's an EU ASEAN uh, Team Europe initiative in the making now, where there's also digital connectivity projects that are really being built. And for example, uh, a digital uh, digitalization index. Uh, the EU is helping ASEAN countries, so countries in Southeast Asia, to develop those uh, so that they can, with that index, um, devise better policies for more inclusive digital growth, for more, um, well, better uh, governance. Um, and of course, this is all governance in the way that the EU likes to see this. And that's where I would like to end, because this is not, uh, this is, as I said, a, an interest driven approach and their interests align very much with our principles and the human-centered approach. I think that's, that's also not a hollow phrase. Um, we could have a big discussion about that also, but it's really our, our industries that could also help bring more transparency and, and continuous freedom also online in other countries in the way that we enjoy it in the EU and that I hope that we will continue to enjoy. So I'll leave it to that for now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maika. Um, you already ended with the human-centered approach and how the EU wants to go internationally with this EU Global Gateway. And um, one question that comes to mind, and I have to ask this as a moderator, of course, is how does it compare to the initiatives by, for example, the US or more specifically China, for example, the digital Silk Road? Is the EU's um, Global Gateway, is it sufficiently ambitious or do you think um, how do you think this will this will end together? Well, the ambition is definitely big. It's just, you know, are we going to be able to deliver the project? So that's really the, the question to me. Um, and I, again, if I see that more funds are now attached to it, I, I take that as an as a sign of, of more ambitious. Um, but this, the funds can never be as big as, as China has been able to uh, to allocate in the past few years. So I think here's where we have to cooperate with partners. Uh, so again, curious to hear about Helene's uh, take on, on transatlantic cooperation. Um, and the difference, I think, is in the United States, of course, um, well, the companies have been given a greater uh, role. And, uh, right, it was, um, well, less regulation and, and less personal protection of data, for example. And the EU took a stance on that and is trying to, to do different. Um, and well, I don't have to elaborate on how that clearly also is different from, from China, where the state has a bigger role, um, not just in this in this regulatory approach, where, by the way, we sometimes see also you know, good signs coming from China. Um, and uh, so the question is really also, how do we continue to engage China and on what terms? Um, but it's really the EU that has put at center stage, you know, the interests of citizens. Um, and, you know, at a loss, I think also, Eric might say this, um, you know, of economic competitiveness. So we're recalibrating this. Um, and for that, I think also discussions with our partners and, and, and you know, the trusted connectivity links that we hear about more often these days are, are really important. Yes. Well, moving on to Eric then for his for his views, the more internal vision on the digital transition from a European perspective and um, maybe also how it relates to, for example, the green transition. You hear a lot of talk about the twin transition, digital green, um, but also, as Maika already mentioned, the role of companies in this discussion. Eric, what would be your views on that? Uh, thanks, Brigitte. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks again to both uh, the IIE and Klingendel Institute for the opportunity uh, to participate in today's um, uh, discussion. Um, I suppose maybe uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, we are um, in engaging in a green and, and digital uh, transition. I'll, I'll touch on that. Um, I'll, I'll touch on kind of where I see Europe now and maybe just offer some thoughts as to maybe where we could go with the transition, uh, maybe in four, four areas. 
So maybe just, I suppose, on, on the digital side first, um, as I think uh, Micah touched on there, the current commission ambition is to make this Europe's digital decade uh, while helping achieve its target of a climate neutral Europe by 2050. So if we delve deeper, you have the shaping Europe uh, digital future, which is supposed to be from the period 2019 to 2024. And we've three pillars in that. One is technology and the other is rules around your economy. So fair and competitive. And then the last bit is, is around being open, democratic and sustainable. I just emphasize that bit there um, just in line with your question. And that's, that's led to proposals at EU level then around the technology, which is AI, um, the first of its kind. Um, and we see uh, on the supply side then there's, there's proposed regulation around data um, and chips, chips act uh, coming down the line. And we'll have to see how that looks. And uh, we've proposals around safety and, and the markets itself. So in around digital services package and, and NIS too. So as Mike had touched on there, you know, last March, uh, the commission proposed a digital compass. Uh, I think that's, that's an interesting and, and it's a positive initiative because it includes targets aimed at, at supporting Europe's further digital transition across those uh, four areas, public services, infrastructure, skills, and businesses by 2030. Uh, an awful lot of, of these proposals are again, uh, have to be viewed through uh, the prism of uh, technological sovereignty or digital sovereignty, which we can come back to, I'm sure, when we're in, in, in the discussion. Um, but we're, we're roughly about halfway through uh, the life of this current commission and 22 months into living with, with the COVID pandemic. So I suppose, where are we really now, I suppose? That's, that's the big question. Well, uh, to me, the pandemic has greatly accelerated the economic and social imperative for further digitally enabled transformation of member states, public services and enterprise, and even human interaction across the EU and it's and it's accelerated by several years and it's, it's not just our own research with our members but you see studies by McKinsey and a variety of other people kind of saying that it's, it, it has accelerated um, digital transformation and we've seen during the pandemic that digital has been an enabler for this connectivity that Mike was talking about it's been an enabler for work for businesses learning social interaction um, even tracking and fighting the virus and in, I suppose research with our own members would show that um, business is investing in, in technology and new ways of working and, and digitally enabled trade. And a lot of that, and there's a lot of studies that would actually say that that change that we've seen is here, here to stay, and it will endure beyond the pandemic. We've also seen the benefits of, it, benefits of regions, states, organizations, and individuals pulling together in the face of adversity during the pandemic. And uh, that would fill me with optimism, actually, you know, when, when we're talking about how do organizations, states, regions get together, um, because we've seen that people are able to pull together and, and that's going to be important going forward. The other thing is that the pandemic has also um, reflected, as I said, the possibilities of digital, but it's also highlighted challenges too. Um, and I would put the challenges as being how do we ensure inclusion of everybody in further digital opportunity, both at home and, and obviously in our interactions with colleagues across the world. And then in, in addressing cybersecurity threats as well. So there's possibilities, but there's also challenges. And I think progress has been made. You can see that there's studies that the, the commission produce in its uh, digital uh, economic and social um, uh, indexes that it produces. These are kind of studies on, on performance. And we have front runners and Ireland and the Netherlands are included in those, right? We are digital front runners. And Europe, I suppose, this is all kind of positive, but I suppose what you see in the DESI reports is a lot done more to do really um, in boosting uh, digital performance and adoption and innovation, um, not just in enterprise, but in public services and in individuals and in our infrastructure as well. So we, we still have gaps to close and there's international comparison studies that the commission has done as well that, you know, our top performers compare quite well against um, international front runners. But, uh, you know, European countries combined still have gaps to close. So it's really a question, not just of, you know, our current state of, of performance. It's, it's both the state and rate of digital readiness. So we're at a halfway point, really. And so where, where do we have to go? So 
I suppose when I think about a, a compass, it provides direction. So we, but I suppose we all have to be able to read that compass and we all have to be able to adjust direction if necessary. And what I mean by that is that we have to have an inclusive digital single market and be dynamic in terms of implementation. Another feature maybe of a compass is that it's also a magnet. It's something that, that people may forget. So to me, it's, it's Europe has to deepen, you know, strategic investment, obviously, in, in trusted um, digital capacities uh, to further this, uh, this recovery that we're going to need um, and inclusive readiness and opportunity and resilience, et cetera. But um, we have to also remain outward looking too. So what I mean by that is a magnet for new ideas, investment, mobile talent and trade. And I suppose um, with that, I, I'd kind of conclude um, maybe with, with some remarks, maybe in four areas, like so just thoughts about, you know, where do we go forward? So the four areas are we in Europe, we need to lead the digital opportunity. We need to safeguard further opportunity and we need to be enable, enabling further opportunity and we need to be including everybody in that. So when I talk about leading it, leading this further opportunity, it's about safeguarding an open approach uh, to a digital transition. So not just deepening our, our leadership in this area, it, it's, it's about deepening that leadership in this area without eroding trust in, in market openness access, innovation, and I suppose choice. You were asking earlier on, you know, what does business think? You know, that's where I'd be coming on that, is taking in an open approach. Second thing is, you know, your question about the, the green and digital. We need, to, we need to support coherence in the, in the digital and the green transition policies, the trajectories, the enablers. And the reason why I say that is because they both these trajectories have mutual dependencies. And so we should try to work to enable both the agendas to work together, I suppose. Um, another thought really in the leadership space is that we've got to try to work with innovation, not against it in our governance. And I suppose the last thing is in, in the leadership side, membership or member, member states themselves they're very important, like they're, they're important economic actors itself, and they can act as catalysts for further digital opportunity, both in terms of the national strategies that bring about the overall EU strategies, but through procurement and creating GovTech ecosystems. Okay, so, so that's just on the leadership. On the safeguard, it's, uh, I would agree with a human-centered approach, we definitely agreed with a, a human-centered approach to, to digital. Um, we agree with the idea of open, fair, you know, trusted, competitive um, markets and services uh, for consumers and businesses and safeguarding people and businesses online. I think that's, that's you know, pretty obvious because, you know, safeguarding trust in the opportunity will mean that we'll be able to invest more in it and bring more about for the benefit of people. Um, enabling further uh, opportunity. I think, you know, we talked about strategies, but We've got to kind of, we, we have a, this idea, this ambition to be, you know, it's Europe's digital uh, decade, but we've got to intensify momentum now on this in, initiative. So we've got to make sure, I suppose, the value of the, the recovery and resilient funds to digital spending are maximized. You know, we, we've put, we've committed money. This is, this is fantastic. We need to make sure that we're getting maximum value from that and, and ensure we've got governance to monitor the spending and momentum in both promoting and realizing um, Europe's ambitions to 2030 on this and in that making sure that all you know this rising digital tide raises all boats so that all member states are brought along um, and I think that kind of leads a bit into uh, Helen's talk now in a second really which is you know again business would you know we're a small open economy so we kind of believe in multilateralism so you know, we think that Europe working with like-minded partners like, like the US through this trade and, and technology council uh, we're going to hear about, and, and by engaging enterprise uh, to shape this digital decade will enable a shared uh, recovery and resilience um, through further innovation and, and adoption. And I think just maybe the last thing uh, to say on this is that um, to include everybody in this further opportunity. So I think a huge part of this now, and we're going to see more of this through the recovery, is fostering and attracting digital talent. So not just fostering fostering indigenous talent, but attracting talent as well. I mean, um, so that's helping our educators, our organizations and individuals with the skills to succeed. And um, I know in our opening gambit um, or you know, the introductory text to this event, we talked about balancing interests, um, you know, to succeed and, and that's certainly true to balance it but it's it's also about making europe interesting to investment as well it's it's, it's a key key thing so 
that that openness and approach um, is of interest to us. So yeah, that's 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 my take on it. But just by way of opening remarks, maybe to spark the, the debate, and I look forward to hearing uh, Helen's view. No, it's it's great that already your thoughts are so so much aligned and, and coherent with each other. But just to stay with you for one second, Eric. Um, I hear you talk a lot about the difference between member states, Ireland and the Netherlands being examples of, of really outgoing and, and uh, developed and digitally enabled countries. But we also saw in the pandemic that some member states were a bit left behind, that they struggled with this digital transition that suddenly was put upon them. And I was wondering um, if you have any views on how you can get every member state to benefit from this digital transition and how realistic is it that all EU member states will be able to, for example, develop coherent policies um, for interacting with the rest of the member states, but also with interacting with the rest of the world. Yeah, I, I think it, I think it's a case of uh, show not tell. Um, uh, you know, it, it's you know, we, as I said, you know, Ireland and the Netherlands are front runners today, but that's not guaranteed. You you know, you as I, I opened with Bernard Shaw, maybe I, I could you know his thoughts of. Life uh, is not about finding yourself. It, it's it's more about creating, creating yourself. Okay, so this is in our own hands. And um, but by being open and and working with like-minded partners, I think you know you can't do everything yourself. So sometimes you have to get the the knowledge in. That's why I'm saying being open to mobile talent because this talent and investment is mobile. Um, in terms of you know making rising, uh, you know rising tide, lifting all boats. There is a group of like-minded countries called the D9 Plus, and that does involve Ireland and the Netherlands as well. And these are like-minded countries who, who um, yes, they're, they're small, open, uh, globalized, but also highly digitalized countries. But they're getting together to kind of speak up uh, for innovation, uh, you know, at European level. They're, they're working to share knowledge. Um, and actually, more recently, just before Christmas, they got together, uh, you know, to discuss uh, you know, twinning the, the, the green and digital agendas. Now, uh, IBEC, who are the Irish Business Federation, we also worked with other business federations across the D9 plus countries um, in a joint statement, encouraging them in this work, because that comes back to what I was saying about show, not tell. It's, it's, it's to kind of show, well, you know, innovation can be beneficial in, in dealing with some of these uh, general, like, because let's think about it, like, where are we going after the pandemic? We want recovery, right? Um, but we will also kind of need uh, to address generational challenges and, and in health and sustainability. Now, technology can enable those, okay, in, in, in the right way. And, and, and that's kind of what we need to do. So we have a, a D9 plus, it's, a, it's kind of an ad hoc group and so on. And I think that's a positive example of where front runners are working together uh, to promote benefits uh, and, and promoting ideas of innovation. So um, it, it, it's more true showing rather than telling. In other words, you should do this and you should do that. I mean, it's, it's more encouraging that way, isn't it? We always can, if you can see it, you can be it, is, is almost, is the way of looking at it. Well, that sounds really promising at least. Um, and then turning to the multilateral uh, site and the international partners, uh, the EU, but also the member states can work with, um, turning to Helene. Um, but before moving to you, I want to make sure to, to say it one more time. If you have questions, put them in the chat. I have enough questions to fill the rest of the hour, but um, I can imagine that the audience also may have some questions. So, um, Helene, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Brigitte. And, um, it's a great pleasure to be here and to be doing this together with uh, also uh, our counterparts in Ireland. Um, when I started thinking about the subject of this uh, webinar, it's aptly called Navigating the Digital Transition. I was wondering, OK, what kind of images does that bring to mind? Huh? Uh, navigating, is this uh, the soaking wet sailor trying to keep his ship afloat uh, in the middle of the night, completely caught off guard in the middle of a storm, trying to steer clear of obstacles? Or is it a much more um, sterile, almost scientific approach um, of careful planning and mapping and consequently also being able to stay the course? 
And I think um, at the outset, let me say that I think that Europe has actually paid uh, a good uh, deal of attention to the instruments that can actually help in proper steering. And therefore, it's proven to be uh, a bit of a captain uh, when it comes to the digital uh, transition. But the question, of course, is can they remain uh, in this leadership role? And Eric already uh, posed some interesting questions uh, to that regard. Uh, but certainly, um, you also mentioned in your introduction uh, that I was posted in the U.S. Uh, working from uh, our embassy in uh, Washington before uh, joining the Ministry of Economic Affairs. And I remember during my uh, tenure there, um, this was when the GDPR came to light and it was introduced and it was, of course, uh, a European uh, invention, so to speak. But it quickly turned into, uh, into a, a standard, a global standard. Uh, and much to the surprise of our American counterparts, uh, I must add, um, and it also spurred some questions um, in regard to their preferred government uh, model, um, uh, because of there, of course, the way of thinking and the overriding principle um, had been so far not to interfere in the market. Uh, to leave it to companies, not to stifle innovation by uh, over-regulating. And even to date, there is no federal law in the US that even closely compares to the GDPR. Um, of course, um, in 2020, California came with its own Consumer Privacy Act, uh, giving individuals greater power over their information. Uh, but so far, only a number of three states have adopted their own legislation, and at national level, there is uh, still a void. And I think the same holds true when you look at the regulation of big tech companies. Um, US government for the longest time uh, very averse to actively uh, regulate, uh, claiming that this was anti-business. But companies themselves also uh, started actively looking for it, uh, asking for it. This idea that self-regulation is a viable option um, has now pretty much been uh, abandoned. Um, but uh, there was a certain notion that instead of knocking on Washington's door, uh, big tech also knocked on the EU's door. Uh, and here you see again, the EU is, uh, is leading the way with uh, legislative, legislative proposals, um, such as the Digital Markets Act, the Digital Services Act. And the US Congress, of course, has organized hearings on big tech, uh, also trying to wrap its arms around um, ways to break the power base of these, uh, of these companies. Um, but they're not yet or not organized in the same way that the European Commission, for example, is uh, with uh, one DG that puts competitiveness first and a DG that puts connectivity first. So, so far, the experience is that standards have been set in Brussels and companies have been very much aware of it, too. Um, I must say this Brussels effect has been diminishing, uh, however, because of the active role of others and most notably uh, China. Now, you've asked me to speak uh, in particularly on uh, international uh, cooperation in the digital transition and most notably between the EU and the US. I'll, uh, I'll gladly do so. Um, uh, but not before also looking back at what Mike has said, that um, there is indeed a, a changing landscape uh, and others are also trying to uh, put their mark. Uh, China, was already mentioned, has been super active in putting forward legislation after legislation that, that incorporates um, technical and digital standards. And of course, their aim is also to leave uh, their mark on global trade. Um, so I would say that in today's world, um, it's evident that the slightly boring and highly technical business of standard setting has become more and more political, and standards are one instrument in the geoeconomic toolbox, um, which is all the more reason to get it right, um, since clearly there is a, a relation with the competitiveness of our businesses and our future earning capacity. Uh, so the Commission is about to uh, publish a strategy. We're not quite sure uh, if this is going to be in uh, the first quarter or maybe the second quarter, but a publish, to publish a strategy on standards. And from the Dutch government's perspective, this, uh, this should tri trigger an even more active approach also from the side of EU member states. And most importantly, also an integrated approach because it's not easy to capture the full scope of the forest if you are only looking up one uh, tree. And I would say that it's uh, uh, all the more important also to work together with trusted partners with whom we share also uh, a set of values and who like us uh, also approach 
technological edge and leadership from a rules-based perspective. So uh, last year, the EU and the US together decided to launch uh, Trade and Technology Council. The first meeting of this uh, TTC was held in uh, September last year in Pittsburgh. Um, and the two commissioners that went on behalf of the uh, EU were uh, Dombrovskis and Verstager, and they adopted several declarations with their US counterparts. Uh, and now in the institutional setup, there are 10 working groups uh, that should serve as vehicles for discussion between um, the two blocks. And topics under consideration are, uh, uh, amongst others, standards, supply chains, clean tech, uh, platforms, consumer protection, uh, but also more defensive instruments such as investment screening and export control of dual use goods. And I must say for the Netherlands, this TTC is uh, extremely important. Um, we'd like it to be uh, maximally effective uh, in the sense that it can serve as a vehicle to facilitate discussion between the EU and the US and um, also to identify uh, possibilities uh, and follow up actions where we can indeed shape the global stage together. And of course, as a member state, it's always um, a bit of a challenge to be completely in the know as to what's happening between the commission and the US counterparts in the various working groups, uh, because this is a commission led exercise. Uh, the Netherlands does plan to um, um, play an active role in shaping of uh, the, the, the substance of these working groups. Um, um, the TTC in that respect, I think, does not just work for the benefit of the EU, but also for the benefit of the member states. Um, and on issues that are particularly important to us, where we have a clear national interest, for example, in the field of semiconductors, um, we want to make that TTC maximally effective. Um, so working through those um, uh, vehicles of these working groups, but also, of course, still discussing with the US also uh, in a bilateral uh, manner. Um, in our preliminary input for the Pittsburgh meeting uh, to the commission, we argued uh, that uh, the TTC can indeed play a key role to bolster the level playing field on which global trade uh, and competition can thrive. Um, and it's important to note also that while EU and US policies may not always align fully, and I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, not sharing any secrets here, uh, but it is true that our commitment to free markets and shared democratic values do set us apart from more um, uh, authoritarian regimes. Um, and in that respect, uh, the TTC should lead to improved coordination of approaches to global trade and technology issues without, on the other hand, undermining the EU's commitment to protecting privacy and personal data. Uh, so this is important to note, while we of course favor a joint approach and we think it would be more beneficial to have a joint approach, we also feel that the EU must keep moving forward on its own uh, regulatory approach. Um, so the TTC is a good vehicle to look for convergence and alignment and also to determine uh, common key principles. And hopefully the TTC will also help to avert uh, some not notorious transatlantic irritants uh, on trade and technology policies, which we've also seen, of course. But uh, hopefully these can be, um, uh, these divergences can be uh, identified at an earlier stage and we'll have the opportunity to engage in consultations to overcome them uh, together. Uh, in any case, uh, as a confidence building measure, we've proposed that uh, the EU and the US should agree on a no surprises policy regarding policy processes on trade and technology. And we should also in agree to refrain from unilaterally taking measures that might directly affect the other, including through um, extraterritorial effects. Um, I already mentioned that there are 10 uh, working groups under the, the umbrella of the TTC and uh, a good number of them actually deal with the digital domain. We have working group one that deals with uh, technology standards cooperation, but also uh, artificial intelligence. And here you could see that uh, the task at hand is uh, to draw up uh, uh, an inventory of all the key technical standards that are actually being set in multilateral organizations. Uh, I think we've already mentioned the importance of taking this multilateral approach. Um, and, and there we can actually strengthen the EU-US cooperation within these multilateral organizations. 
um, and, and make sure that we uh, put um, yeah, our weight in these um, international bodies, such as the, IT, the ITU and the WIPO and other standard setting organizations. And also when it comes to artificial intelligence uh, in the context of the global partnership on uh, uh, IA. Um, the Internet of Things is, is another uh, um, domain where we can uh, work together. Uh, that's uh, uh, also a priority for the Netherlands. Um, the Commission is working on a um, uh, Cyber Resilience Act, and here we issued a non-paper last year on how we would like to shape uh, that Cyber Resilience Act. Uh, again, uh, we have certain wishes in that regard, but we also keep uh, a very close bilateral cooperation with the US. Um, on cyber cooperation, and you can see why. I mean, in, a, in an era where um, there is um, uh, so many uh, incidents and attacks that we witness, and the scale uh, in which this affects uh, potentially our societies, it's it's really important to get the, the fundamental approach uh, right together. Uh, then maybe another word on the, on working group five, on the, which deals with data governments and technology platforms. Uh, here as well, we see several uh, areas for cooperation, including uh, content regulation. Uh, this is an important topic eh, where we, we strive for harmonizing content regulation while also maintaining freedom of speech. Uh, targeted advertising. Uh, so here we foresee an exchange on mechanisms to regulate this targeting uh, advertising in both the EUS and the, uh, in the, in the EU. That would be very useful. Uh, finding convergence in subjects uh, regarding facilitation of digital trade, more understanding for each other's positions. I mean, that's an overall objective, I think, uh, when we discuss the TTC, uh, and also, again, to boost international discussions. Um, so th th those are just a number of issues, and we can maybe uh, elaborate on them a little bit more. Those are being discussed uh, under the umbrella of the TTC. I would like to end maybe my introduction by saying a few words on uh, digital sovereignty. Um, I, I believe it's part and parcel of the debate that has very strongly emerged within the EU on, uh, on open strategic autonomy. Uh, in our view, this means the capability to guarantee our own public interests in an international context. Um, yeah, so to speak, the maintenance of our own strategic agency on a global stage and where we feel that this agency would be compromised or we are put in a position that uh, makes it hard for us to, to meet our own public uh, interests because there are maybe unwanted dependencies in ecosystems or in supply chains. We must really look for ways to regain uh, control and strengthen uh, European economic resilience. And this is very much on top of mind also uh, during the French presidency of the Council and in Brussels uh, discussions. And this also holds true for the digital uh, domain. Uh, and Eric has already spoken uh, about this, and I very much uh, concur with him that um, the Netherlands, as a, an open and very outward looking country, uh, will always try to work towards strategic autonomy in an open manner, uh, working together with our international partners, such as the US. Uh, and this is also uh, part and parcel of our tradition um, as a very uh, yeah, internationally oriented country that always wants the rules-based legal order to uh, prevail because this creates stability for a trading uh, nation. Um, but we do see that this objective of resilience uh, and the way to achieve it uh, that's also very clear in the new uh, coalition agreement of the Dutch government. Um, we, we see the need to do this, uh, to strengthen this resilience. Um, it does reflect the times we live in and um, the necessity of, uh, of uh, clear navigation. Um, so um, uh, it's also something I think, uh, and Eric also correctly addressed this, that if we want to meet our ambitions regarding the digital and the green transitions, it's important to, um, to strengthen uh, resilience uh, in terms also of uh, strengthening ecosystems and um, uh, in the digital area as well. So maybe I'll leave it at that for now and happy to take uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think one question which has been posted in the chat, so that's great. If anyone has more questions, post them in the Q&A. Um, and it is about the the, 
the thing that we are not talking about the economic and the societal digital changes but there's also uh, substantially uh, security and defense uh, elements that have been or are being uh, digitalized and how does that relate to this society and economically orientated digitalization in the eu what does this uh, digitalization and security mean for emerging competition globally? Um, I can start with Helene, um, but if any of the other uh, panelists will will also um, have the floor, then just put your hands up, and I will give you uh, I will give you the floor on this question. Yeah, so I think it's fair to say that this digital transition is is everywhere. Eh? So also uh, you see it in the uh, in the area of security and defense, of course. Uh, I briefly touched upon uh, the whole uh, um, uh, threat that we find in uh, in cyber attacks, but also other hybrid threats that are now more of a, um, uh, of a reality than we uh, foresaw maybe even uh, 10 years ago. And I think governments uh, are, are uh, uh, well are forced to sort of uh, come to terms with this uh, with this new uh, reality and. Um, Therefore, for example, very important that the Commission works towards a Cyber Resilience Act uh, as well. Um, I mean, I think when it comes to security and defense, it's always uh, harder to, um, uh, to come to agreement uh, in an EU setting. Uh, it's, uh, it's more of a, still a, yeah, a part of the foreign policy uh, uh, and therefore it comes with its own uh, complications. But absolutely fair to say that, uh, of course, in this domain, uh, there are also certain challenges that will have to be addressed. Eric, Mike, does any of you want to uh, comment on that as well? Otherwise, um, oh, yes, Eric. Yeah, sorry, just uh, maybe um, maybe not so much security. That might be a bit outside my uh, um my level of of expertise but just more i mean i did because i did make the point that um in leading an opportunity you've got to safeguard trust okay so i suppose just on on, on the cyber security side of things we do have to take a i think we we are trying to do this but take a proportionate risk-based approach in 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 pairing and, and harmonizing our cyber security and resilience okay um and i'm by that, I suppose we need to make sure there's kind of coherence between our different rules. Um, you know, we've got rules on NIS2, we've got uh, DORA, we have GDPR and so on. So, they, you know, ensuring we have coherence on that. Um, I suppose another thing maybe for business just on, on cybersecurity is, um, you know, that offer some flexibility, you know, where, 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 you know, it's technically feasible as well. So that um, because... I suppose when we look at things like the NIS2 enforcement and sanctions, you know, they should be kind of proportional and contextual. So you want to incentivize people along on cybersecurity uh, resilience um, rather than, I suppose, being too punitive. So, you know, that's one one aspect. And I suppose just the other thing, maybe just on cybersecurity, just as a broad um, sense, like obviously we're, we're obviously in, in, in favor of that, but it's in, in engaging in industry and ensuring that the rules and standards not only just encourage indigenous cybersecurity capacities, but we have to remain open to further international uh, cooperation and trade with like-minded partners so that I suppose we get the benefits of shared information and best practice on evolving threats and uh, and that, that we not only safeguard cross-border data flows, but we also get the economic benefits from them as well. Um, I think that's just a I suppose maybe to expand on, on what Helen was saying there too, that, uh, you know, being secure, but, but also being um, open, I suppose, with, with uh, like-minded partners who reciprocate, I suppose, uh, you know, our values and, and, and approaches and so on. Micah? Yes, well, I'm also not an expert on, on security and defense, but uh, but even so, in in the many discussions that I've had with uh, with officials and uh, focusing also on, on Indo-Pacific, what we notice is um, cooperation also between different uh, trusted partners, governments in the world, uh, European and Asian, on on cyber defense. And this is where our Ministry of uh, Defense, for example, is establishing new relationships with uh, well with countries uh, for example australia japan south korea 
uh, that also have capabilities in, in, in this field and, and have different threat perceptions, uh, oftentimes because they are closer to a specific one specific threat uh, geographically than we, than we are and have built uh, their defense, digital defense accordingly. So I think there's interesting uh, learning uh, and, and best practice exchange also intensifying in, in that domain. So that's where I see um, actually more cooperation than, than competition. Um, mm -hmm. Although, well, between trusted partners uh, co uh, cooperation. Uh, another one that is noticeable um, is uh, for example, uh, robotics and autonomous defense systems. Uh, where also the impact of AI is obviously huge. And, um, you know, we see sometimes sort of this disaster scenarios of robots uh, that are going to be very, um, you know, acting by themselves and making the decisions themselves. I think most experts agree that's not where we are uh, by far. Uh, but there's, there's a lot in between and how to regulate, how to develop standards um, to ensure that the competition we see ongoing there is also sort of regulated or actually managed. Um, are extremely important. So definitely, yes, in, in even just these two examples of defense, uh, I see uh, I see the digital the digitalization also having a huge impact and, and being a disruptor as well as an enabler here also. Thank you. Um, more than I could expect uh, these answers. Perfect. Um, maybe moving back to the economic side of things, uh, especially of digitalization, of course. Um, and that is the digital policy supporting the small and medium enterprises in Europe uh, across the member states uh, to become more interconnected, not only in terms of collaborative innovation, but also from a trade perspective. Um, I think it would be a question for Eric. Um, how are the European policies, uh, digital policies, supporting that? Sorry, I was trying to get off the, the mute button there. <laughs> I forget that. Um, so again, I suppose your, your, your digital decade, uh, your, your digital compass points to that um, because it's, it's prioritizing support for um, necessary um, infrastructure um, skills, but also I think to help uh, SMEs, it's in adoption as well uh, and, and connectivity. So um, I suppose going back to my comments at the start, how do we ensure that happens? It's, I suppose, we, we've got the proposal on the digital decade. People have made commitments in spending that. Um, you know, we, we have uh, OECD recommend, like at, at home here in, in Ireland, there's OECD recommendations on helping SMEs adopt digital more, and, and the government is moving to make those recommendations a reality. Again, there, there are things about, you know, in and around infrastructure skills and adoption. It's, it's that adoption piece. Uh, helping businesses uh, in adoption. I, like, because I suppose what's sometimes missed in this debate, Brigetta, is that um, digital isn't just about ICT companies. It's about companies who are using uh, and adopting uh, digital innovation and data as well. So like, if you were to look at, I suppose, Eurostat data on, on, on its at face value, you'd almost say, well, there's 80,000, um, digital professionals, in other words, ICT professionals, or whatever in Ireland. But if you were to look at people who are working in digitally intensive sectors, in other words, product uh, people who both produce and also use those services, that that number goes over two hundred thousand. So it's it's SMEs who are. It's not just you know your startups and your scale ups who are making products and process. These are you know very very important we need to support them as well um but it's then other businesses who are using those tools in other words in in other ways so i mean um as i said the digital decade is one way they can support obviously i suppose what's happening uh, through the the trade and technology council that that can help too i think where we want to get is i suppose in in a country like ourselves and probably again helen might, might answer to the situation in the netherlands we have a lot of foreign direct investment. We've also a lot of indigenous uh, tech as well. Um, you know, this is this is about creating synergies between inward investment in their knowledge economy and uh, the indigenous sector and building clusters. And that's that's what it's about. Building clusters can also help. Um, and I suppose as well, member states using, I suppose, their, their position, I suppose, to procurement and so on can help build that gov tech that can help SMEs too. And I think also, um, 
you know, maybe in terms of Europe itself, where, where Europe could also help SMEs is by championing trade. And I think that's what Helen was saying in, in her opening remarks there. It's, it's working with the OECD and World Trade Organization to build this multilateral framework that, that helps people invest more in further innovation and, and trade online. And at the same time, using you know, free trade agreements and maybe mutual adequacy decisions as vehicles to promote further bilateral digital trade um, cross-border data and service flows, while at the same time protecting privacy. You know, you want you want the two to go hand in hand, uh, and you know, you know, you've also then if, if by positioning um, digital at the heart of the trade strategy, that helps the the small and and, and big companies rebuild uh, and grow both in local and and also foreign markets. So, um, I suppose that by way of of those comments, maybe that that's that's the way I would I would look at it. I see you nodding, Helene. Do you agree with Eric? Um, your mute button is still there. Uh... Right, sorry for that. Um, no, yes, maybe if I can add to that, uh, I think uh, a lot of um, uh, the digital skills aspects were uh, addressed also in uh, the, the publication that the Commission did uh, on the digital compass. Yeah, it's a very uh, a uh, comprehensive document uh, setting out objectives in different uh, in different uh, areas. Um, I mean, for the Netherlands, um, we rank pretty high on this um, uh, DAISY index of, of digital skills. Uh, and so, um, yeah, the assumption is that there is a certain digital maturity with, uh, with um, a good 80% of our population. But still, uh, when you talk about small and medium enterprises, we do feel that there are um, uh, extra challenges uh, and, and also um, the Commission is right uh, to, uh, to address these um, within the, the context of the digital uh, compass. And um, when we had to make an appreciation of that uh, publication uh, around the time it came out, we also um, informed our parliament that this would be a, a focal point of our attention. Uh, because we are not quite sure the commission put quite ambitious goals uh, forward in uh, the digital compass uh, to, to get to a certain basic level of uh, digital intensity by 2030. But how to measure this exactly uh, was um, yeah, still a bit uh, uh, in the open huh? as a question mark for us. Um, for us, it's really important that um, yeah, stakeholders such as uh, SME and uh, chambers of commerce, that they are also involved in uh, in in um, uh, uh, implementing these these um, different stages in uh, the road to to digital maturity. Uh, let's say because uh, we see that SMEs, of course, also have been uh, hard hit by the pandemic. Uh, they are already struggling in many respects, and and this is also um, uh, putting a challenge for them and. Um, uh, not just in the Netherlands, um, uh, which ranks pretty high up on this DAISY index, but other EU member states as well. This is certainly uh, uh, an area where we, uh, yeah, where we we can't leave it. You know, we can't lose sight of it uh, in the implementation. So it's an important point. Yes, Micah. Yes, I was wondering perhaps if I can interpret the question a little bit differently. The question was maybe about support to SMEs for the digital transition that they are going through, um, or was it also a question of support for you know companies that work in in the digital sector of you know fintech or uh, otherwise? Um, if if it was that, I would also you know add to what just has been said um, that you know the importance of ensuring that you know there's sufficient funds and european funds for scale up so that when we have successful companies um, they can actually also scale up and stay european uh, because uh, mm -hmm. you know many of them have been bought up by uh, you know american or increasingly also chinese apparently um, uh, bigger companies and that is i think it goes at the long-term loss of our economic competitiveness um, so that's to me also, um, you know, an, an, an area where, where I think we have to be thinking of if you're thinking of support to SMEs for um, in, in well, digital domain. Yes, yeah, so maybe to stay with you for uh, for a second, Mike, uh, would you also say this would improve digital resilience? That's not a question from the chat. How can we improve digital resilience? Um, how can we improve digital resilience? Well, some 
part of it is in the, in the technology, of course, that we build, uh, because technology is, is not neutral. <laughs> you know, sometimes uh, still you hear people saying it is neutral. I think it's not. You know, the one, the people who develop this have their own, um, you know, uh, set of, of, of values and, and they develop technologies uh, accordingly. Um, so knowing actually the technology that we use and, and, and making sure that, you know, the, what we actually, most people here use has a certain values and, 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 and more. Um, is more secure, uh, I think is important. And, and then the skills, of course, um, Helene mentioned it, um, the basic skills, because there's the advanced skills and the basic digital skills. And I think that's a huge difference. We are competing also for advanced digital skills for talent. Um, that's something also that we need to invest in um, for the long-term economic competitiveness, but for economic resilience, it's really also the basic skills. Um, and, and well, for that, well, I don't think I well have to elaborate. Uh, I'm sure Eric and, and, and Helene would have uh, better things to say. Maybe yeah, we maybe on, this, on this issue of digital resilience, I think it's very uh, multifaceted. Huh? You can look at it at, uh, at different ways, but but overall, I think to, to safeguard uh, our resilience, it's very important that we have our own house in order, huh? that the, fun, the foundation uh, uh, is right. So that has to do with also uh, the single market, uh, making sure that what we uh, agree on uh, is, is enforced uh, in terms uh, of the single market, but also we can still improve uh, and deepen the single market when it comes to the digital domain. Then I think uh, it was interesting to hear Mike say um, regarding um, uh, the global gateway that this is kind of the external uh, dimension of, um, of the, uh, the industrial policy that the EU is uh, uh, pursuing right now. Uh, if you look at uh, the EU's industrial uh, policy and the, the, the strengthening of ecosystems and the instruments that are uh, being uh, designed for that, uh, I think it's very much geared towards increasing our, uh, our digital resilience, for example, uh, uh, by putting forward uh, these alliances between, in, between industry, stakeholders, also governments. Uh, could work together in the context of um, important projects of common European interest, eh, which also have to do with um, uh, with the whole infrastructure, the digital infrastructure, the cloud infrastructure. Uh, the Netherlands uh, has has signed up to uh, this uh, this uh, important pr project of common European interest. I never know how to pronounce the abbreviation, but IPSAI or IPCAI uh, on cloud infrastructure. Um, so, so trying to see how we can uh, improve our own standing. So it's, it's for me very much a layered uh, approach, uh, which starts with getting your own foundation uh, right eh, to, to, to make sure that uh, all the achievements of the, uh, the European project, uh, such as the single market, but also our competition framework, our trade policy framework, uh, are all sort of stepping stone, stones to build towards this resilience. And then, um, yes, indeed, to, uh, to get the, the right kind of uh, incentives for, uh, for the private sector uh, to actually uh, maintain our, uh, our, um, our edge in the technology and to, uh, to be able to keep this, uh, this technological leadership, um, uh, which will translate in a, in a, in, in a more resilient, and more digitally resilient Europe. Um, for, for me and, and where I'm coming on it, uh, Brigetta, I suppose it's it's three C's really on, on that. Um, and I think the uh, Micah and, and Helen have touched on this, but it is it is coherence uh, is, is maybe the first bit. So you know, as Helen had said, coherence at um, EU level. I mean, we we do need to complete the single market. Um, it's not just me saying this. No, it's it's uh, European institutions themselves. You know the the uh, European Parliament research services and so on um, would would kind of have research on this, saying that the single market is kind of incomplete and we we still have um, you know conflicting rules. And I, I suppose I, I did touch that on that in some of my remarks that you know <clears throat> in. It's one thing to kind of lead on on regulation globally, but you have to ask why, um, you know, to what end? What's the impact going to be? Um, so, I mean, you know, completing the single market is definitely is definitely one. And, and I suppose the second then is, is coherence in the rules. 
that that we're we're making. So that would be kind of cooperation. Second thing, um, or sorry, coherence. Second one is cooperation. And I think we we've, we've touched on this a bit throughout the 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 um the talk, which is um, and I, I've I've listened to some some of the other talks actually in this series, which I very much have enjoyed. You know, around chips and 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 varieties of different things like that. And and what's quite obvious in a lot of this is that, um. Of course, we have to develop um, our own capacities where we have weaknesses, but that also does not mean that we try to do everything ourselves. You know, that, that's, that doesn't make any, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. We, we still have a very globalized wor world and trade does actually reduce conflict and bring about getting people talking to each other. There's cultural exchange. This is, you know, historically shown and so on. So. I suppose cooperation, um, and and we talked about that with the TTC um, as one example. But you know, obviously, from our perspective, and maybe you know, small country like ourselves, uh, the more open and 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 um, engaged we are with the world, and and the, that we have more engagement and less conflict, then that brings more stability. It brings more trade, and it's obviously good for hopefully for everybody. So cooperation would be the second thing. Um, but to me as well, it's actually three, it's capacity building. Um, and, and I think Helen touched on this, it's, it's, it's capacity building in our people. Um, so for people who need to upskill or reskill, um, it's for the, the coming talent that we need um, and um, you know infrastructure as well, I suppose. So building capacities in all of these areas. And it's not just, how do I put this? Maybe just to throw it out there, be controversial. It's not just capacity building in things we already have. I mean, I know in, our, in earlier in the discussion, we were kind of saying, well, when, when will Europe have the next, um, you know, whatever um, platform or whatever? I mean, that's what kind of exists today. What about tomorrow? So in other words, I think Europe has to be not just thinking about, uh, how do we build something that's comparable to what already exists? You know, I know people are saying that. Is that always necessary? Uh, should we be thinking about what's the next big thing? Um, that's that's about investing in the R and D, and that, that capacity building is very important because ultimately, the more competitive you are, the more you have more money you have to then fund the things that you want to do, whether it be resilient, like fighting pandemics and so on. Um, so competitiveness, it's kind of as long as I've been with IBEC, you know, competitiveness has always been an issue. And uh, after, after the pandemic, it's still going to be an issue, you know, so because true competitiveness, and, and I do believe we do have a, a, a resilient model of, of substance here. And um, we, are, we are moving in this uh, green and, and, and digital transition. Um, uh, so, you know, it, it's capacity building is going to be important. So it, investing in the innovation piece, I think we haven't really touched on that. I, I, I do think we need to emphasize that as well. Um, it's not just for building what's here today, but if, to quote Joyce, you are tomorrow what, uh, not Joyce O'Connor now, obviously, but jo James Joyce, uh, <laughs> another illustrious Joyce, uh, but we are tomorrow what we what we do today. So obviously, if we invest in in innovation today, we're going to be more innovative tomorrow and therefore more competitive. Um, and I think that would make us more more resilient. Yeah, one thing that directly comes into my mind is, for example, quantum, which is now something that is being invested in, but it's still really new and it still needs a lot of R and D before it's even slightly on the market. Um, I see that time, and I think we can have one more question. Uh, and that would be something to, to, to look at the future, like what would be the key thing the EU should prioritize going forward, and it can be uh, an innovation such as quant quantum, but it could also be a partner. Would, should we more invest in relationships, for example, with uh, Japan or South Korea or India? What is like the blind spot, uh, the priority you want to give away at this, uh, at this webinar? And uh, maybe we start with Micah, then Helene, and then Eric, you will be the, the last one to have the floor. And then um, real quick, everybody, because we only have one minute left. <laughs> okay, so real quick, just one key takeaway that, or, uh, that I would like to, uh, to, uh, to emphasize again. 
um, it's it's not a blind spot because this is you know we're slowly getting there, but it's you know could be much faster, should be much faster with uh, and between all stakeholders, and that's really again the digital connectivity element of global gateway, which I think is really about promoting the four elements of the digital compass also externally. So let's not just look at the EU, but let's realize that our resilience is also dependent on the environment and the surroundings that we live in. So we can be secure, you know, all fine, but we're in an interconnected world and especially our neighboring regions, but also the regions closest to, you know, where the, where the difference is the biggest. That's, I think, where we have to be much more active and also take those four elements of the digital compass. Hello. Yeah, I can't do any cherry picking. Honestly, I think um, I think we need to move on different uh, fronts, uh, so to speak. So um, I think, yes, the four elements of the digital compass are extremely important, but it's also um, good to approach um, uh, the strengthening of European resilience with uh, uh, with some new dynamism, let's uh, let's say, and uh, in that sense, I'm really happy to be uh, on uh, the doorstep of this new Dutch government, which uh, in the coalition agreement has really uh, made the case for a strong uh, role of the Netherlands uh, uh, in uh, the European Union to make the European Union uh, uh, maximally uh, effective. Um, uh, very good to be uh, uh, open towards the outside world uh, to still have that uh, that emphasis on international cooperation i think uh, it's in our uh, in our genes and we should uh, remain true to that uh, like uh, like eric said uh, and within the eu to make sure that um, that we can actually achieve results and um, if it helps to be uh, in a group like the d9 for example which uh, um, which uh, tries to set the agenda and, and um, uh, move forward on uh, on common goals. Uh, that's really very helpful, and um, I think we're we're ready and happy to do our part in that. Thank you, Eric. Real short because your three C's were already very illuminating. Uh, well, again, very quickly. Again, I, I think it is about uh, deepening the investment and the capacities, but also remain outward looking to. Um, whether it's to investment, mobile talent, trade. But I suppose uh, one other thing which would be super um, would be, um, you know, transatlantic agreement on, you know, successor maybe to, you know, privacy shield as well would be, um, would be uh, fantastic to uh, further progress and encouraging um, uh, both the EU and, and the US on that side. Um, so that's, that's me. Thank you so much. Um, we will let the audience go now, but not before I thank you, the panel, one more time. Maaike, Helene, Eric, Joyce. Uh, it has been really a pleasure. I could speak for hours about this topic, so, um, but, but I will let you go because we all have to go back to work. Um, and of course, I want to thank the EAI colleagues for hosting this session today. Um, I think it has been a fruitful discussion and nice joint cooperation. Um, and for that, I want to say goodbye to you all. Thank you for being here and um, have a nice afternoon.